Ah, well, it's reopened. <laughs> well, I suppose that's good. I need to keep up the footfall. Everything has to move on. Well, yes, but, you know, it is still your museum, Morris. It wouldn't be here without you. Ah, it was never my museum, Sparky. It was Shelmerston's. It's changing, but, you know, I think it should. So, what happens now? How do we find 4,000-year-old memories? Ah, come with me, Morris. There's one more thing I ought to show you. Uh, oh, okay, Sparky. Well, don't suppose I'll ever look at Aggie's room the same way again, will I? Morris, take a look at those skulls, please. The skulls? Well, they have memories inside them? Oh, that's rather morbid, Sparky. Not quite. Look, I didn't explain this before because I felt things were confusing enough, but that slicing is a bit more powerful than I've led you to believe. Well, well what do you mean? Well, we aren't limited to memories of people who are alive. People are bounded by time, but memories aren't. Check it out. Oh, I didn't think dead stomachs could get queasy, but here we are. Where are we, Sparky? When are we, Morris? This is Shelmerston in Aggie's time. You should be able to find some memories of her here. <laughs> you are some dog, Sparky. <laughs> It was the worst night in the world when Aggie was born. It began in the old village, the one swept away by the rivers of fire. The ground shook and the earth split open and spat sparks. The sun hid and the huts burst into flame as we fled. I thought we would all die. Everyone washed in the burning orange death and Aggie's mother howling with the pain of the child coming. We made it as far as the cliff top by the sea. The mountain was still roaring and roaring. The rock ran in rivers toward the sea. The air smelled of death and poison. But Aggie was perfect. Small and angry, her tiny fists pummeling the air. I used my knife to cut the cord. We chose a spot for the new village closer to the beach. The burning rivers cooled to pumice and black glass. I made sure everyone knew that a life that began in this way would be special. Not everyone believed me, but Aggie proved me right. My goodness, giving birth like that must have been awful. What a terrifying situation. Hmm. So, where do you think that knife is? Should we look around here, or...? No, I I'm pretty sure I've seen that knife before. Back at the museum, I reckon. Okay, Morris. Let's go.
And to think that people had not long stopped using flint tools when this was made. There is so much history in this knife. Ooh. I'd love to see what else it got up to. I'm getting the scent of Grenkins again, Morris. I'll pop up to let you know when we're close to one.
Of course we watched her. We had heard of her birth and seen her on the shore. Her feet sometimes in the seawater, her body in the sun. We did not show ourselves at first. As a test, we left the mirror on the black shore, born of the volcano on the same day as her, and waited to see what would happen, to see if it called to her. She picked it up, turned it from side to side. She took it home. The next time I saw her, I introduced myself. We sang together, and I showed her how the mirror worked. How if you emptied your mind and thought of air and light and sea, you would see things in its surface. How things would unfurl in the future. Aggie was better at mirror gazing than any of us sea folk. She saw a girl, her own daughter not yet born, as leader of the dry folk. I told Aggie to keep on gazing into that mirror, that one day the island would need something more than a leader. I had a box of rocks that looked like that mirror somewhere. Where did I put it? is really powerful, Morris. Can you feel it?
was always fearless. My mother Aggie told me there was nothing I couldn't do. With Otsul and without, I hunted the deer in the woods and the hares on the mountain, all before I had taken my first lover. And younger still, one time Aggie had me knock her tooth out when she was in terrible pain. I didn't mind even when the blood poured out. It was easy for me. Spears and knives were my nature. Death and courage were my meat and drink. I knew about Aggie's mirror, of course, but did not believe all of it. When Aggie warned us the Mauler was sick and there would be fewer calves for the following years, none of us listened. It was to be my first cull. I wanted their blood. It was my nature. We would not take less of the Morlo just because an old woman told us to. She came to the beach after the Morlo slaughter. Her hair wild, eyes burning with fury, raged and shouted like a woman out of her mind. We had killed too many, she said. Then she left the village, told us she was done with all of us forever. As Otsul marked me with oil and blood, I did not mourn my mother leaving. I was young and foolish, and the sight of her ashamed me. But of course, I did not see what was to come. To think that they were still having the same arguments about the Morlo way back in the Bronze Age. Aggie must have sensed the trouble ahead. Maybe she was trying to find a way to prevent it. She was alone, and I would bring her food sometimes, some fire and sea urchins. She would make dry food and we would eat it together. Textures unlike any we knew that broke apart in your hands and in your mouth. We would sing together, make tea together. We became her family. The dry folk left her alone. She had a companion for a few seasons, a hind, who came down from the mountain and slept at her fire. And then, for a few more, a golden hair that ate from her hand. One night, we all felt it. Those of us in the water and those above. The island waking, rumbling, alive again, more furious than before. I found Aggie awake, tending her fire, unsleeping, unresting, staring into her mirror. She told me she'd seen the island sinking into orange fire and boiling sea, lost forever above and below. The village and our town in the sea caves, all gone. Aggie went to the shore and blew the sinistral shell, calling our people up from the water. Aggie sang for them, the oldest song, and we spoke for some time. That night, 
The sea and sky was all the same color, a deep gray blue like a mackerel's back without the glitter. As the dawn approached, Aggie left the beach to return to her people, to tell them what must be done. I... I'm not sure I want to see what happens next. We have to, Morris. Such a small thing, but it changed the entire course of our island. Only one more riddle to solve, Morris, and then... And then? Wondrous delights, Morris, wondrous. <sighs> yeah, right. Quiet, dog. You're in the company of riddle masters here. Just one more, Morris. One more. Incredible work, my boy. Superlative effort. Oh, I well, well, thanks. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mr. Whitstable. And now, for your reward. Oh, boy. Here it is, Morris, your very own certificate of riddle mastery. <laughs> wow, oh, thanks, Mr. Whitstable. I, oh, I don't know what to say. I'm so proud of you, Morris. And listen, whenever you want to look at this certificate again, to bask in your own brilliance, you only have to press pause and you can look at it again. And now, a song. <laughs> I walk when I play and I play when I walk. I can run but don't walk. I have a mouth but don't talk. I grow in the winter. I die in the spring. I have eyes but don't weep. I have a song but don't sing. What am I? Why am I? Why do I exist? Who owns the fish? Riddle me this. Chris, 
I'm getting the scent of a new place on Shelmerston we can go. It smells like... Oh, Grenkins. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let's take a quick look. We heard the shell, and knew Agi had returned. Ibni was the leader then. It had taken many seasons, more than we would have liked, but there were finally enough Morlo again, and our village was growing. We were strong. Some of the younger ones didn't know Agi, and didn't want to hear her. Called her a moon shot and crone, but Ibni looked in her mother's face and saw the truth of it. The end would come. The earth was growling again. There would be hot rivers of death and clouds of poison. But Aggie brought us the answer. She would give herself to the island. Ibni's voice shook. Surely a deer or a goat would be enough. The year's finest blackest calf. Aggie cast down her eyes and shook her head. We all knew. I offered my blade, but Aggie turned me away. She took her knife that had cut her own cord the night the volcano last erupted and wrapped Ibni's fingers tight around the bone hilt. It must be you, Ibni, she said, and it must be now before the sun comes up. This day, this morning, or we are all gone, the village, the people, the island. Agi embraced her daughter. Ibni whispered something, but I could not catch the words. Both women's faces shone with tears. Agi sat on the ceremonial stone, the tears streaming now from all of us. Agi delivered her final message. She told us her body must not be burned or given to the sea, but laying in the earth of the island beneath the mountain. Ibni was shaking. And then I realized it was not just Ibni. The whole island was trembling under our feet, waking up. Aggie told Ibni to be quick, the end was coming. As Aggie took Ibni's hand and guided the knife to her side, we saw the fish folk rising from the sea, hundreds of them, so many. I had no idea there were so many. Aggie was quiet the whole time, but Ibni cried out. A sound of longing and hurting from her heart like I had never heard. Then she fell silent, and as Aggie's life poured from her body, the island and everything on it fell suddenly still. 
utterly still. We wept then, in sorrow and relief. Then the fish folk were among us, countless, numberless. One embraced Ibni, holding her up as it seemed her own legs might give way. When the sun came up that day, land and sea folk stood together for the first time, talking and singing the old songs, Aggie's songs, together. Ibni and the fish folk took Aggie up onto the mountain. They laid her in the peat alongside the knife and all the things she would need on her journey. Ibni watched over Aggie for days afterwards. Before she was covered, she placed a sacred carved stone, Aggie's beloved hair, inside her mother's mouth to guide her and help her keep the mountain still forever. And so it was. Oh, Aggie. Now that's bravery. It feels a bit well, disrespectful looking inside Aggie's body like that. You were the one who dug her up and put her on a plinth, Morris. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but I... But I uh... <laughs> Relax, Morris. This body isn't Aggie anymore. She's long past needing this old thing. Hmm. Well, all right then. Okay, Morris. I'll level with you. We absolutely didn't need to find Aggie's mementos in order for me to sniff her out. She's here, waiting for you. She has been this whole time. But then, wh why did we need to visit the Bronze Age? Aggie thought it was important for you to see those memories, so you would understand her path before you met her. But also, wasn't it cool? <laughs> that it was. Things I've seen now. Oh, Sparky, thank you so much. To think, for a while there, I was worried that being dead was going to be boring. You are very welcome, Morris. Okay, so, shall we go say hello to Aggie? Yes! <laughs> Sparky, it's so good to see you both. Hey, Aggie. You, uh, wait, you, you know me? Of course I do. Morris Lupton, one of the best loved men in the history of Shelmerston. With the very finest dog. Uh, me? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Come now. Let's go out of this place. Into the air. The one part of Shelmerston that looks just the same as the first day I saw it. I suppose it always will. Oh, I love this beach. It's always been my favorite beach. I'm gonna go run! Aggie, look at Sparky. She's shining. Mm. That's the hope and the joy shining out of her. That's it, isn't it? The, the, the point of all of this. It is hope. Home. This island. It chose the two of you just as it chose me. And where will you be heading now? Heaven or, or something? Heaven? What's that? Well, 
I don't quite know how to explain it. But to me, it would be an awful lot like this speech. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm hoping to see Ivni, my daughter. It's been a very long time, but I remember her. We never forget the ones we love, do we, Morris? No. I don't suppose we do. I think she wants something, Morris. Huh. Would you look at that? <laughs> I just found a tennis ball in my pocket. <laughs> Here you are, girl. 